Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our 2016 Sir John Graham Lecturer, Professor John Hattie. I want to put an argument here this evening, and it's taken from the perspective of looking across the Tasman back to home. And I do keep a constant watch. I read the newspapers every morning. I do have an ongoing relationship, a very close relationship with Cognition here in Auckland, which keeps me well in tune with what's going on. And I want to put it to you that over the last 15 years, schools in New Zealand are finding themselves chasing the same academic pot of gold in a market where being academic, having high achievement, is the prime indicator of market value. Thus, there is little incentive for schools to change and adapt what they're doing and develop more successful learning models that's needed for our students and our schools today. This narrative that we have in New Zealand about what success means has led us to have an overzealous focus on the wrong drivers. We've got a massive debate, and I challenge you at any dinner table to talk about schools, and it won't be long, about how you go about choosing schools and differences between schools. Folks, in the year 2000, New Zealand had the lowest between school variants in the world. And that means if you take two kids of the same achievement, it did not matter what school they go to. How did we allow a debate about which didn't matter? It's a marvellous distraction away from the debate that does matter. Do we give parents the choice of teachers? Well, I understand why we don't. But because of this choice, and I certainly know in Melbourne, I tried to check the figures on Auckland, I didn't find them, but in Melbourne, 60% of children every day pass their local school to go to another school. And it does not matter. But we've created this debate. And it's led, unfortunately, to continuing residualisation of the public school system as the parents hunt the magic grail somewhere else and believe that if they spend more money, they're getting a better treatment. It's led to more low-income families and students facing greater obstacles as they're segregated into some of those uh, lower decile schools, some of those so-called residualised schools. And you see that constantly throughout New Zealand. It's led to more cruising schools, both Australia and New Zealand, when you look at the international results, we have the largest number of cruising schools and cruising kids. And the argument is that if the kids have got that academic success as they come in, we don't have to add much. What a disaster that's turning out. And I would argue that this is the major reason for the decline in New Zealand's performance. In the good old days, and for me that's the year 2000, I remember working with Trevor Mallard when I first came to New Zealand. New Zealand was in the top five of the world on almost every measure you could measure. We're not anymore. We need a reboot. And I want to put to you this evening that that reboot comes very much related to the narrative about schooling. And I want to see in New Zealand a narrative built more on focusing in efforts to report expertise, quality, teachers, to work together. I want to say it again, to work together. We should not allow, as the fundamental assumption of our profession, that every teacher and every principal has the right to run their class and their school as they want. If it's not having an impact, they have no right to autonomy. But how do we get them to work together to debate and argue and answer the question about what high impact means. When I analyse the ASTOR results, close to a million kids following them through years 40, years 13, and I go back at the time I did, I said the biggest problem in New Zealand is teachers do not have a common conception of progress. It's random. Every time your kid hits a teacher, whether your kid will go up or down, depending on that teacher's conception. Not good enough. Their progression and their understanding of challenge needs to be contested. What a better place to do it than within the school without the whiff of accountability. And if they can then demonstrate at a school level 
not a teacher level, that they are having the desirable impact, which I want to comment on tonight, then I think they have the right to be left alone and do their job, almost. I also think they have an obligation in the profession to work with others. How do we reliably identify that expertise? How do we do it in a way that doesn't damage? How do we open our classrooms so they're not private enterprises with moats and alligators around them? And how do we then target resources at the needs and fund the expertise? Here's New Zealand. I have to ask, is New Zealand the world's biggest loser? That should be a dramatic graph of our results in the international stakes. We're not only going down from the top five to close to the 20th in the world, our absolute value is going down. It's not just that other countries are getting ahead of us. And we've gone down systematically. Now, I have good news. We're not the world's biggest new losers. We're the world's third biggest losers. Now, let's be careful. Australia is the world's fourth biggest loser. <laughs> Now, you can dismiss the tests, you can dismiss the results, you can dismiss the analysis. But I make no bones about it. Schools are there to add value to kids' knowledge of literacy and numeracy and writing. That should shock us. Investing more in the same is not going to fix that graph. We have been overly focused on school differences. We've had too big a debate about the wrong drivers. And as school choice gets successful, yes, then schools do get to choose the kids they want, which wasn't the aim, surely. But that debate has not helped us, and I would argue can be traced to a major reason for our decline. I think we should have an argument, a, a driver, that school should be inviting places to learn. Like Hank Levin showed that the best predictors of adult health, wealth and happiness is not achievement at school. It's the number of years of schooling. 97% of adults in prison in my state, Victoria, didn't finish school. The costs are enormous. I like the notion that we've had a focus on level two. And you can see, over the last five years, all parts of our community are going up. I know there's some games people play in that business, but it's not a bad driver. Can I suggest to you what's next? Level three, it drops off dramatically, particularly for our Maori and Pacific kids. It's not bad having a target. It has made a difference. And despite some of the games, many students have been beneficiaries of focusing on the success of getting students through. Now, let's go for year 13. So I look down at this table tonight and say, what a challenge it would be to now, we've caught some success, let's up the ante. New Zealand has an equity problem. We are reasonable quality, low equity, and we're slipping down. This is the latest graph, and you can see New Zealand right down there, not in a desirable place. Our haves and our have-nots are moving apart, and I just ask you to contemplate for a moment what happened in England recently with Brexit. You can trace the country who left and who stayed in terms of who had and who had not in terms of the success of education. And I put it to you that when Donald Trump said the statement, as he did, I love the uneducated, he's feeding his community. That gap cannot increase. And I certainly look at Maori and Pacifica students, and this is the graph taken from the ASTO results. Where's the tail? What a false argument that is. Where's the gap? There are two gaps. And of course, I worry about the gap of our Maori and Pacific students below the average. Surprise, surprise, there's just as many Maori and Pacific kids above the average as there are below. Worry, worry, who is concerned with our Maori and our, and our, and our, uh, our Pacific students who are above the average and that gap and underachieving? The only program that I thought was successful in New Zealand with evidence was Tikotangitanga. And I have to say I'm dismayed that it has been stopped because it addresses the expertise of the teachers. Instead, we would rather deal with the symptoms of the kids. And I ask you if you were here last year to remember what Peter Sharples was talking about. He doesn't have a problem teaching his Maori kids. He doesn't have a problem teaching his Maori boys. He's invested in that. There is remarkable success in that community. We have a major problem. 
in trying to find ways, evidence-based ways of making a difference to those kids' lives. We know it. We haven't got the courage to continue to do it. Vicky mentioned my work in meta-analysis. And this is a graph of a quarter of a billion students. The red zone. These are the things we do in schools, in our community, that harms kids. And as you can see, there's not many things that we do that harm children. Isn't that good news? But the other side of the coin, well, in fact, some of those down in that red zone make perfect sense. Like the effect of bullying on achievement is about minus 0.2. Sensible. Makes sense. When you take those into account, 95 to 97% of things that we do to kids increases their achievement. We have to stop asking what works. Because everything works, almost. And if we keep asking that question, we privilege those who come up with strange ideas. Like the Minister of Education went to bed last night. In the middle of the night, she had a great idea. It will work. Every parent can tell you how to run your school. They are right. Every teacher can tell you that they are successful. Have you ever met a teacher who said they were below average? They're right. And this is what's killing us. Beware of educators with answers. <laughs> Many of them don't fit the problem. And certainly what my interest is, and what I've spent the last 20 or 30 years trying to work out, is what's the story underlying those teachers and schools in the blue zone compared to those in the yellow zone. And our model is simple. We go into schools, we reliably identify those teachers in the blue zone. We form a coalition of success around those, and then we invite those in the yellow zone to join. And we do it with a passionate and relentless pursuit about their impact. I couldn't care less how you teach. I don't want to hear another debate about how you teach. I don't want another app, another resource, another curriculum, another assessment because they missed the point. I care about the impact of those. And we look at the impact on the test scores. We look at the impact in terms of student voice. We look at the impact in terms of classroom observations of the impact on the kid. And it's not difficult to ask about what expertise looks like. And the good news, Terry, we're in about five or six, five or 6,000 schools around the world at the moment doing this. Everybody who goes into teaching went into it to have an impact on kids. All we're doing is feeding that. And certainly, when we started Astle, I remember a particular person, I won't name him because he might be on the front table. He got up one day and he said, look, this is where the kids are now. If you haven't moved them up here on this Astle scale in six months, you're not doing your job. And I cringed and thought, oh, there's the end of Astle. That was the start of it. Teachers are hungry for this information. They loved it. They wanted it. And I'm very, very proud of the fact that whilst it's a voluntary system, it's still incredibly used across this country 16 years later. The need, the desire, and the passion relating to impact is certainly out there. Look at those. Now, the numbers don't matter too much, but remember point four is the average. Those effects are tiny. I put it to you that so often in the policy area, in the newspapers, amongst the parents, and particularly amongst the educators, those topics dominate, and they virtually don't matter. Yeah, I can do those things, but to think of you making a change to the lives of kids, I'm sorry. And what I want to contrast this with is the next slide. Look at those low numbers. Look at those high numbers. It is the collaborative expertise. It is those schools where you have a school leader that is focused on the impact of the adults in that school on the lives of kids. That ask the questions of the students about what it means to be a learner in the school. What it is that you're learning? How do you go about your learning? They don't ask you what you do. And so parents, don't ask your kid what you do at school today. Get them to have a focus on learning. 
And as my son knows, in their whole life, as they went through school, all four of them, the same conversation every night, I asked them, what feedback did you get from your teacher today? And I invite you to try it. And I invite you to be patient, because it may take you six months before you get the first answer. And all I wanted these guys to do is at least once a day to listen to some feedback and learn how to receive it, because that's the biggest problem with feedback. Most of us, and I'm the best at it. I've been married 31 years, and my success is I'm the world's best selective listener. <laughs> and so are kids. So it's not, for example, how much feedback you give. It's what's received. It's not what you teach. It's what the impact is. And if you look down those, I think they're pretty stunning. And how do you build a collective enterprise? And how do you do it across schools? Because it's not good enough to do it in one school. If you get the answer wrong, you never know. I've got a, a, one of the jobs that um, you said, my new job over the last two years in Australia. I've moved to the dark side. Australia has um, federal government. They have um, many states. We have 26 jurisdictions in Australia. I'm the um, cabinet appointment uh, in charge of AITSL. It's mandate, and I love saying this. I'm in charge of the quality of teachers, principals, and teacher education across Australia. Yeah, and we realised in the early days that if we dealt with those 26 jurisdictions, with the departments of education, with all those things, we would be bogged down. So we realised something. Teachers are the biggest users of social media. So we went directly to them. And now we have 95% of teachers and principals come to us on a regular, if not a weekly basis. And we have got four levels of teachers. And if a teacher wants to apply to go up the levels, they pay the estate a certain amount of money, they pay the estate a certain amount of money, they are evaluated in terms of their impact on kids. Yeah, there are protocols they follow, they have to do certain things, but we don't care about how they teach. We don't want to know about your philosophy of teaching. We only care about the impact of that philosophy. And yes, our job's to moderate it. We now have, I called all the highly accomplished and lead teachers to a, a workshop about four or five months ago in Adelaide. They all came, one or two exceptions. And we asked them during the, eve, during the two days, what can we do that can best help advance expertise? It's a bit sad, I have to say. Wouldn't it be nice, they said, if our principals recognised us? Someone come up and congratulated. Someone worked out how to use us. Why are we in a profession where we are the best at denying our expertise? There is incredible success out there. And my fear is we're going to lose it by having the wrong narrative. And yes, I could wax lyrical about what we're doing in teacher education because that's the most bankrupt industry I know. And hey, I've been a dean in three different places. I've failed three times. But we have to get that right. It is not working very well at the moment. And I have a mission that's our focus of our program at the moment. But this notion, and I have a lot of confidence and hope that if the Education Council in this country gets the right agenda, it can make a difference. I watch with interest and I certainly would try and like to help in any way we can by giving you every resource in Aitzel for nothing so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel so you can get on to what the right narrative is and that is how do we esteem, identify and use the expertise that's out there. I'd have to say my problem in Australia at the moment is we also have principal standards and they're flat. You're either one or you're not. It's not working. And to change that so they have levels. It's just not true that every principle is equal. And the debate about what this word impact means. I, I never answer the question directly, because my answer is I want you to tell me, school leader and teacher, what you mean by impact. I'll give you some hints. I do want to see some changes over time. I do want to hear student voice. I do want to see some evidence about your impact in the classroom. But most of all, I want to know what you and your school understand what a year's growth for a year's input means. I want you to tell me about the magnitude of it, because as you saw, just getting any effect is easy. And I want the equity question. Are all your kids getting that year's growth for a year's input? It is the right debate. You have unbelievable resources in this country. They're the only country in the world that has, at each teacher's fingertips, the tool to do that. So don't tell me you haven't got the resources. Every other country still looks with envy 
at the tools that the schools have in this country to do it, to answer that question. We can't answer it. And I use this graph, because as I've talked to politicians, parents, principals, they say, yes, we understand. It's not just about high achievement. It's also about progress. But when I walk out of the room, they say, oh, we've got to have high achievement. And my worry is, when you look at that graph, is too many people think high achievement are those top two, two parts of the graph. They are not. Great schools are the two in the progress areas. And some of our best schools in New Zealand are our low SES schools where achievement isn't high, but growth is stunning. But they get in troubles because they don't have every kid above the average. And the biggest problem I see in New Zealand is I, as best as I can analyse the data, you have too many schools up in the cruising category, particularly high schools. How do we change the debate from schools need to make every kid Einstein to schools have to show that they add growth, at least a year's growth, for a year's input? And yes, resourcing teachers to do their work, and yes, you have ASTL, it's there. We have tools to know about the progress and the achievement at the same time. And the proud thing I'm about it is that ASTL is the embodiment of the notion that assessment is primarily about feedback to teachers, about what they did well, who they did well with, and where they go next. That's the success. And how do we open classrooms? Graham Nuttall, a famous New Zealand educator, did an incredible amount of work, and one of his findings was 85% of what happens in the classroom, a teacher does not see or hear. Which is why I have no time for all that teacher reflection nonsense. <laughs> why would I care about the 20% they looked at, that they saw? What I care about is opening the classrooms to help the teacher better see their impact. And what we're doing in our team now is we're saying, can we come up with a way of doing it? Like having a video in the room, oh my gosh, it's expensive, then you have to analyse it and you have to watch it and then two weeks later you get the results and the kids have moved on. Having someone sit at the back of the room with a tick box, expensive and unreliable. So we've worked out a technology now that we can come into any classroom in the world. In fact, we're doing a random controlled trial in England next year with 240 schools, 3,000 teachers. We've done 5,000 teachers. And I can sit here right now and I can analyse that. But even better, the teacher teaches the lesson, and by the end of the lesson, they get a transcript of everything they've said. They get the analytics, as you see there, based on the observation with a 0.99 reliability, whereas we don't pay the firm that does it. And the kids can comment on their own learning. It can be done within that 40-minute period. It actually takes us three seconds from the time the teacher talks to deliver back to the kid's laptop exactly the teacher said. This is all possible. This is not in the future, it's now. We have ways of helping teachers understand their impact. And so the whole technologies out there to ask this question are all around us. Have we got the courage to put on the table that it's about building collaborative communities focused on the impact? Stopping the debates about how we teach and about curricula and about all the peripheral stuff, the class size, choosing schools. I'm not sure we have the courage, but we have to because what drives me is the incredible success I see on a daily basis in schools. And my fear is losing that. I do want to comment on starting early, because in our science of learning work, I've realised I've made a mistake in my career. I've had some focus in my time with four and five year olds. Sorry, it's too late. The biggest change happened between zero to two. But the time kids get to school at age five, how many words are kids exposed to? The difference between kids in high-resourced families and kids in lower-resourced families, that difference between those two groups of kids in terms of the number of words they are exposed to is 30 million. What chances of schools of catching up? And certainly our work has shown that by age eight, if they aren't at level two on the PISA standards, I can show you Study after study from the metasynthesis, it's almost impossible for those kids to catch up. This is why we have to look at zero to two. And what we did, because it's a very strange community, the early childhood, they think the answer's play. I don't. Nothing wrong with play. 
as long as the purpose is learning. So we went out and found the program that had the most stunning effect on kids' learning, the Abyssidarian program. We got Joe Sparling out of retirement at age 84. We took his 160 learning games. We modernised them. We're introducing them with zero to two, and we're getting stunning results. We're getting the parents actually speaking to the kids. We're getting that language up. We're reducing that $30 million gap, 30 million word gap. And I ask you here in New Zealand, your debate about early childhood, I'm afraid, is stuck because you don't have the courage to talk about what learning means in those age groups. The answer is not social and emotional development alone. It's not teaching them to read or write. But we do have a major problem. And so my comments to you tonight is how do we find unlikely alliances? I noticed in Australia over the last five years the biggest change has been the growth of social venture capital and philanthropy into the school system. And some of those social venture capitalists now are running some schools with the teachers in interesting ways. Not taking them over, but running. I fear if we're going to invent a whole new group of schools around that. That's not my aim. I see some stunning ways in which we can get some schools. We have our own network of schools at the University of Melbourne, and I was so pleased last year when our richest school in Melbourne took their bus and took their teachers out to a very small, low SES country school because we put on the table the evidence that that school had a dramatically powerfully impact writing program. That's the kind of debates we need. We've seen that here in New Zealand. Mangariatara was a stunning success. Malakalana, the focus is the same, the relentless focus on the impact. But as I work with schools and teachers so often, they want to come out of their schools and not talk about that. It can be done. There are many examples. And my challenge and provocation to you this evening is has you as a community, particularly of parents, those of the education system, prepared to stand up and say, no longer are we going to say that the fundamental premise is that every teacher and every principal has the right to teach and run their school as they like. But every teacher and every principal has the fundamental right to collaborate with other teachers, with other principals, with the parents, and particularly with the students, about the quality and nature of their impact. Thank you.